we have an exciting announcement to make. We've officially joined The Democracy Group, a new podcast network of eight shows dedicated to civic engagement and democracy. We'll be working alongside independent podcasters and organizations like the German Marshall Fund, the Niskanen Center, and the McCourtney Institute for Democracy. Sign up for the newsletter at democracygroup.org. Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Jusara Lee. She's a clothing designer who evolved over the last 18 years from selling her signature label at fancy department stores to now focusing on hand-tailored, locally produced, custom-made clothes. Her goal is to create sustainable fashion with low impact to the environment. This is another episode on how we can each individually reduce our carbon footprint. It turns out that producing clothes is extremely hard on the planet. And what's more is that humans today have wasteful habits when it comes to our clothing. The environment takes a huge toll. It takes uh, 713 gallons of water to produce enough cotton for one white t-shirt. And then on top of that, you have pesticides and fertilizers to maximize the production of the crop, animal abuse in the case of goats raised for cheap cashmere, the leather tanneries with chemical dyes that contain mercury, heavy metals like lead. Then there is also a huge amount of oil that goes into the industry for all the plastic hangers, plastic bags, shipping across the ocean, We'll be talking about the negative impact of fast fashion on our environment, falling in love once more with the clothes that are already in our closets, and our ability to change behavior for a sustainable planet. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm so flattered to be here. In this day and age of abundant, cheap clothes everywhere, let's briefly go over fast fashion. How do you define fast fashion? So fast fashion is a term that derives from the food industry, actually. It mimics its business model of big amounts of cheap food for the masses at a very low cost. So in, in fashion, the way it relates is that there's cheap textiles, there's cheap labor, mostly sourced from underdeveloped countries where the laws don't protect individuals, they don't protect the environment. The opposite of it is slow fashion. And it's not so well known or articulated in the media, but uh, it first popped up in around 2006, 2007 as an antithesis to fast fashion and everything it represents. So it challenges the advantages of quantity over quality. It brings to the forefront the polluting impact on the environment, the exploitation of human labor. Fast fashion comes at the expense of the environment and at the expense of human labor. There are some really crazy stories about inhumane working conditions. So Can you give us an example of what fast fashion workers would look like and what really slow fashion workers would be like? Well, for the people that work in the fast fashion industry, it's like going to work on a daily basis and risking your life. The conditions are so terrible. You might be walking into your workplace where the walls and the floors and the ceilings are cracked and it can crumble, which is the case of what happened in Rana Plaza in, I think it was 2013. And the death toll was 500 people. There was a fire in Bangladesh in a place called Tazreen. They simply blocked the fire escapes because they didn't want their workers to take breaks. In the slow fashion, the worker is the boss, (laughs) basically. I mean, I can only speak for the people that I work with. So we do custom-made clothes. It's a very slow pace operation. We have master tailors that are very knowledgeable, 
they are almost a dying kind, but、uh, we try to really bring value to what they do, and there's so much respect because they really know what they're doing, and so the the pace is low because they. They cut a pattern to individual people's measurements, and the way it's sewn is actually by hand. We do a beautiful program with mending, where people can actually bring their own clothes to have either invisible mending or creative mending, where we, let's say, we. Patch a little hole, but then we throw a little embroidery over it, and it turns into something new. It's quite exciting to be in that segment of fashion where you have these beautiful relationships with the workers, and there is a lot of respect and consideration for what they do, and vice versa. Since you talked about mending, and in contrast, of course, to fast fashion, which on average. Apparently, according to some studies, are worn seven times before they are discarded, literally thrown away, and then they are sitting in a landfill. And what you do is something called upcycling. Talk about upcycling and and mending and the other initiatives that you have. Yeah, it's a project that we started after I read that the average American doesn't wear eighty percent of what's in their closet. So I thought, wow, gee! After all the huge toll on the environment, on the people, on animals, the plundering of natural resources—I mean, there's so much that goes into making clothes, whether it's fast fashion, slow fashion, any kind of fashion, right? And then people don't wear 82 percent of these clothes. I thought, you know what? I'm sure people wouldn't mind to have something. Done to these extra clothes that are just sitting idly in their closets, and why not add some creativity to make these clothes that are just obsolete and turn them into something new? We don't approach it as upcycling, but we actually approach it as transformation, because I want to have people feel almost that、like、they are buying something new, and these new clothes are coming from their own closets. I also wanted to celebrate people that can do things by hand, so we do hand painting, hand crochet. This is not machine, so it's a very low carbon footprint on that transformation because the idea really is to take these used clothes and transform them into something new without the polluting effects that would take place if you were to make new clothes. Right. So let's talk about the polluting effects of fashion, because you mentioned earlier about cotton coloring producing the raw materials essentially that make fabric. Right. So it's kind of、uh, very sad, <laughs> but the environment takes a huge toll. It takes、uh, 713 gallons of water to produce enough cotton for. One white T-shirt, and then on top of that, you have pesticides and fertilizers to maximize the production of the crop. Animal abuse in the case of goats raised for cheap cashmere. The leather tanneries with chemical dyes that contain mercury, heavy metals like lead. Then there is also a huge amount of oil that goes into the industry for all the plastic hangers, plastic bags, ship. Across the oceans, just to go <laughs> further with the bad news, synthetic materials have what's called microbeads that doesn't get caught in the filtering system of your washing machine, so it actually gets washed into the water streams. So then it goes back into the food cycle, and we carry these microbeads in our bodies when we drink the water or when we eat fish. So that causes a lot of diseases. The idea is to just wear and purchase less clothes to begin with. I'm sure we'll talk about the clothes that we donate. What happens is that there's so much clothes being donated that much more than half of what is donated ends up in the landfills, ends up getting incinerated. And God forbid you'll have to live in a place near an incineration plant, because that for sure will cause you pulmonary cancer and all kinds of diseases. Oh, we're doomed. 
Let's talk about scale now, because now that you've described what's really happening to make a new piece of clothing, essentially, or, and also what's happening to the clothes that we no longer wear, what's the solution? Because, you know, we're going to continue to buy new clothes. We're not going to stop. And we want to only buy sustainable clothes. What do we do? How does that work? Well, I think that there are a few things that we can do. One is to buy less. Uh, because obviously, if you have uh, so many clothes in your closet that you're not wearing, it's not that you really need it. In fact, there are so many options in your closet that you can be well-dressed and you can be yourself and have a sense of style. You actually don't lose anything. In fact, you gain because there's a sense of um, being connected to what is going on in our planet, which I think is very rewarding. I feel wonderful about knowing what's going on and being a part of the solution. I think that gives you a sense of belonging, like you belong to this planet. So buying less, buying quality, I make clothes custom made. Obviously, it is not cheap and it's all made here in New York. If you can't afford doing that, there's always secondhand clothes. You go to a secondhand clothing store. Some of these clothes have never even been worn. There are clothes with their labels still hanging off of their lapels. And then demanding, I think, is a wonderful way of uh, preserving your clothes to eternity. So to eternity. A lot of solutions. You mentioned just now about the cost of having something handmade locally. And I just wanted to tie that back quickly to the sad events in Bangladesh you mentioned earlier. I remember at the time that in the newspaper they reported that the people who worked at Rana Plaza made 11 cents, something really tiny. And then compare that with the degradation of the planet with all the water that we're using to make a simple white t-shirt. Now that you are upcycling and you're doing slow fashion, how have you changed? Well, I try to have as much of a positive impact as possible within my small operation. So I go around and um, give presentations at educational institutions like Parsons, FIT. I was invited at um, Columbia University. I think you can grow without growing exponentially, which is the usual business model. The fact that I am a small-scale company has the limitations of reaching out to less people because we just don't have that size and, and uh, visibility. When it comes to bringing sustainability to the business uh, area, it's a little bit more challenging because you need to make a buck. You need to pay rent and taxes and employees and whatnot. It makes no sense to just implement these measures in my personal life and not at work. So I just ban plastic. We don't have an Amazon account. We buy things in shops. We are so thrifty about paper and we produce very little garbage because we don't ship things. We don't get things shipped. All the fabric leftovers are turned back into textile. We can do embroideries with them. We cut the little leftovers from the custom orders in strips. All the shopping bags that are nice were made outside of the country, and they had huge minimums. So I decided that we start making our own shopping bags. So we make the handles out of these little fabric strips. And then there is this uh, lovely artisan in Brooklyn. It's a company called Weaving Hands. And I gave her all these fabric leftovers, and she's able to weave them on a hand loom and turn them into textiles. So then we go ahead and we make clothes with these panels of handwoven strips of fabrics. We just have to always step up on the, the creativity level, like creativity here in this kind of situation, in the workplace where we, we want to be sustainable about all the, the little garbage that you produce. So what is sustainable fashion that is sustainable because you mentioned you have to 
still pay people, you have to pay taxes. How do you do that? Because if you're not really selling new things, right, then how does it work? So basically, no matter what, you're going to produce some pollution just in, inherent in, in our existence, right? I think that the real definition of sustainable fashion is small scale. If you do everything on a big scale, you are going to extract a lot. You are going to produce a lot of uh, garbage and you're going to utilize a lot of fossil fuel, even if you try to make it sustainable. If I just keep things in a very small scale where you just take and you just use what you need, then it's ultimately the most sustainable way to practice your profession. There is this beautiful quote from Gandhi where he basically he says that the world has enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. And that's basically what I believe. You just take as little as you can, use just as much as you need, and then there's going to be plenty because we are living in an overpopulated world. We need to be very efficient about our natural resources and distribution of food. We need to be extremely smart about those things because of the sheer number of people that live in this world. Well, you made a very compelling argument for the planet and also the people who work. And what about our society at large? What do we gain as a society when we use our resources better? Oh, I mean, really the big conundrum is how to mobilize the masses to practice a sustainable way of living because that would actually make a huge impact. The corporations are out there to make money. If uh, we boycott simply don't buy things that you don't believe is for the common good and is just benefiting certain shareholders. If you actually take action with what you buy, there could be a monumental change. Sometimes people say, oh, Jasara, you're so naive. Look at all this plastic. And here you are going out of your way to save this little bit of plastic. And I say, well, yes, but if I think that way, then there's really no solution and no hope. And I know that my little tiny actions on the vibe and the energy that emanates from it actually can produce a lot more results. That's what I think could be the solution. It's a movement that starts from the bottom up, which is usually not the case, actually. You know, we were here hoping that the government and the corporations will change their way of conducting business. But it's not going to happen if we, on the mass level, don't put the pressure. So if you care, you have to express it. You have to show with your dollars, with your actions, that you don't believe in what they're doing. Then I think they will go back and say, oh, they're not buying this. And then they will change, hopefully. So what's a good example where consumer demands are met and a company changes behavior. Well, for example, in the fashion industry, H&M, the huge fast fashion company, last year they were sitting on $4.3 billion worth of merchandise that was unsold. It sounds like a lot, and it is. It just gives an idea of the scale of their production. They were very worried because consumer behavior has changed. The rabbit is out of the hat. Now everybody talks about things in terms of the pollution and all these hidden costs that are not monetized in the actual cost of the clothes. H&M sitting on $4.3 billion worth of merchandise is a great example of consumers making different choices, sending them a message. And what happened is they started a place in the stores where you can drop clothes that you don't wear anymore with the promise that they will recycle it. 
I am very suspicious about all these promises, but it definitely shows that they are getting the message and then they're trying to do something to get those clients back in their doors. So what is one concrete thing I can do as an everyday person to support sustainable fashion? Aside from not buying any more clothes. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the number one thing. Now I have to really go, you know, shopping in my closet. Right. So I'd say go and look at the clothes that you don't wear and give them a second chance. Sometimes you don't wear and you don't know why. People come to me and they bring up a couple of pieces of clothes and they're like, I just don't know why. Then we start talking about it and then we realize why. Sometimes it's something like two inches on the length that's either too short or too long. Sometimes it's the buttons or shoulder pads or it just feels a little tight. It, things that are so easy to be fixed and then you fall back in love with the clothes. I love it. Uh, rescue your fashion. Fall back in love with your old clothes. Why are you passionate about this? I think it's because I'm a clothing designer. I've been a clothing designer since I was six when I discovered that the power of clothing with my dolls. And I, I remember like all these girls, they wanted to be my friends because I just made all these really cool clothes for my dolls. So I was like, oh my God, this is so powerful. <laughs> Now I feel like, oh, okay, we have all the, the this completely different scenario of clothes, the, how, the pollution that it creates, the fact that people don't wear a lot of these clothes that they buy. There was a period that I just really was questioning, if people don't need these clothes, why am I here cracking my brains to make more clothes if there's no need for it? So that made me a little bit unenthusiastic about my career my profession, I sort of had to figure out a way to rescue that passion. I said, well, this is a problem. So how can we solve it? And then you start practicing, you know, this and that way of, of solving these problems. And then you become passionate about it again. That's great. So looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? What makes me hopeful, I think it's actually people, young people, middle-aged people, old people, all kinds of creeds and religious. We talked a little bit about the power of critical mass. Older people have the benefit of, of not working, like they're retired, they're knowledgeable, so they can do something for the common good. Young people, because really their future is at stake, so they have that need to participate in, in the solutions. And all of us in the middle, because I feel a little guilty about things that I did when I didn't know the repercussions of my actions. So, and so I feel like I want to try to fix that. So what really makes me hopeful is that people across the board in all different generations will and are getting on board and are participating on changing the world to be better because it's only that way that the big guys are going to change their behavior. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for being on Future Hindsight. Thank you, Mila. I keep thinking about Gandhi's words that she quoted, the world has enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. And maybe it's not so much that we're greedy, but just that fast fashion is so easily attainable. And because it's so cheap, we don't assign any value or significance when in fact the total opposite is true. It's extremely costly on our resources to produce at this scale. I can't get my head around the fact that 713 gallons of water are required to produce one t-shirt. And what's most depressing is that there's so much used clothing that there is not even the market for it among the needy. Goodwill is already overwhelmed with our used clothing that much of it gets burned, creating even more pollution. One of the most interesting things that Jusara touched on was the idea of scale. No matter what you're doing, the more you scale up, obviously, the worse it becomes for the environment. And we should really think about this as consumers. We have to ask ourselves, can I get this product from a local manufacturer? Or do I have to buy it from a mega manufacturer? And if the latter is the case, 
think again if you really do need it. Next week, our guest is Jerry Taylor. He's the president of the Niskanen Center, which he founded in 2014. He's working on winning the war of ideas among conservative policymakers in order to pass climate legislation. We'll be talking about the psychology of climate denial, the political realities behind policymaking, and the carbon tax. This is a global collective problem that requires a collective global solution. And all of the mindfulness that one person may apply in their lives to reduce their carbon footprint is collectively not going to do very much. As long as the energy infrastructure looks like it does, you can economize all you like on how much energy you use, but if that energy is coming from fossil fuels, it is not going to address this problem in the meaningful sort of way that we need to address it through public policy. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for listening to Future Hindsight. The executive producer and host of this program is Mila Atmos. The audio producer and music composer is Peter Fedak. The associate producer is Miriam Zumpul. Additional production by Brooke Sayan. Listen to us online at futurehindsight.com or your favorite streaming service. That's all for this week on Future Hindsight. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to Future Hindsight. And consider sharing us on your social media or with your friends. Word of mouth is the best kind of endorsement we can get, and it helps us produce more great content in the future. Also, if you have the time to rate or review our show on whatever podcast app you use, we greatly appreciate it. It might not seem like much, but those ratings really do help. Also, feel free to drop us a line at hello at futurehindsight.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'll be back next Friday with a new show, and we hope you'll be there too.